Welcome IBC readers to the King of the PG Update for December 26, 2008, also known as Boxing Day to our Canadian viewers, I am Penny Pixel. And I am Quincy Quarter. First up, the Globe and Mail is reporting that the financial arm of General Motors, the GMAC has received the OK from the US government to receive bailout funds, they quote. Analysts had speculated that without financial help, GMAC would have had to file for bankruptcy protection or shut down, dealing a serious blow to GM's own chances for survival. The Fed cited emergency conditions in justifying its decision. The move to rescue an auto financing company was just the latest extension of the federal bailout program, which has designed to shore up ailing banks, but has grown to include insurers and credit card companies, and later on state, under the Fed's order, Cerberus and GM, whose businesses are mainly outside banking, would both have to significantly reduce their ownership stakes in GMAC. GM has committed to reducing its ownership in GMAC to less than 10%. Cerberus was ordered to reduce its stake to 33% of total equity in the company. Finally the paper makes this noteworthy statement. Congress approved the bailout program on October 3 with the original intent of buying up troubled mortgage assets. That part of the program has never been implemented. Instead, Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson switched course. He began an effort to use $250 billion of the $700 billion fund to make direct purchases of bank stock to inject more funds into financial institutions and fight the most severe financial crisis in seven decades. But the effort has come under attack from critics who say that the Bush administration is not overseeing the programs efficiently to make sure that the banks actually increase their lending. Many lawmakers are also upset that the program has already obligated half of the $700 billion total without making a serious effort to help troubled homeowners avoid a rising tide of mortgage foreclosures. On Christmas Eve, report on business.com posted that the Labor Department reported that initial requests for jobless benefits rose to a seasonally adjusted 586,000 in the week ending December 20th from an upwardly revised figure of 556,000 the previous week. That's much more than the 560,000 economists had expected. Our math department notes that this is 6.2% revisement and 5.5% higher than was expected. Furthermore, the Globe and Mail reports that a labor department analyst, meanwhile, said auto-related layoffs were a factor behind the rise in jobless claims. The four-week average of initial claims, which smooths out fluctuations, rose to 558,000. That's the highest since December 1982, when the economy was emerging from a steep recession. Over at the IHT, they are reporting the obvious trend of the last 10 years, which is that the Chinese have been fueling the bull market and that the so-called economic recovery after the 2000 recession was, in fact, an illusion. Mark Landler writes, in the past decade, China has invested upward of $1 trillion, mostly earnings from manufacturing exports, into American government bonds and government-backed mortgage debt. That has lowered interest rates and helped fuel a historic consumption binge and housing bubble in the United States. Later he writes, the inaction was due to a range of factors, political and economic. By the yardsticks, that appeared to matter most. Prosperity and growth. The relationship between China and the United States also seemed to be paying off for both countries. Neither had a strong incentive to break an addiction, China to strong export growth and financial stability, the United States to cheap imports and low-cost foreign loans. In Washington, China was treated as a threat by some people, but mostly because it lured away manufacturing jobs. Others argued that China's heavy lending to this country was risky because Chinese leaders could decide to withdraw money at a moment's notice, creating a panicky run on the dollar. But he points out the inherent fallacy and the root of the real problem. But Americans did not use the lower cost money afforded by Chinese investment to build a 21st century equivalent of the railroads. Instead, the government engaged in a costly war in Iraq and Consumers used loose credit to buy sport utility vehicles and larger homes. 
banks and investors, eagerly seeking higher interest rates in the CZ money environment, created risky new securities like collateralized debt obligations. He argues that it was the trade gap that helped fuel the consumer craze of the new century and posits, but in classical economics, that trade gap could not have persisted for long without bankrupting the American economy. Except that China recycled its trade profits right back into the United States, it did so to protect its own interests. China kept its banks under tight state control, and its currency on a short leash to ensure financial stability. It required companies and individuals to save in the state-run banking system most foreign currency primarily dollars that they earned from foreign trade and investment. As foreign trade surged, the hoard of dollars became enormous. In 2000, the reserves were less than $200 billion. Today they are about $2 trillion. And he ends with a stark fact that should be in the front of the mind of any investor these days. For the past five years, China has been one of the most prolific bidders. It holds $652 billion in treasury debt, up from $459 billion a year ago. Add in its Fannie Mae bonds and other holdings, and analysts figure China owns $1 of every $10 of America's public debt. The Treasury is conducting more auctions than ever to finance its $700 billion bailout of the banks. Still more will be needed to pay for the incoming Obama administration stimulus package. The United States, economists say, will depend on the Chinese to keep buying that debt perpetuating the American habit. Finally, in the abbreviated trading on December 24, the QCNAT or technical indicator registered a buy when the daily high was recorded at $29.21 against the five-day moving average of $29.39. Thank you for tuning in and be sure to catch our upcoming special on using the chi-square to evaluate performance on the Laughing Crow YouTube channel.